Welcome back, my friends, as we embark upon week five of Wilderness Wanderings, Making Lasting Footprints in the Sand. Last week, I came to you from sunny, warm Florida, but today I come to you from cold, snowy, and overcast Michigan. But I'm home, and it's nice to be home because for most of you, you all know that I spent the last month in Myrtle Beach and Florida and what an awesome time I had with God oh my goodness I just can't even begin to describe to you what God did in my heart through that time and um, but but just two things really quickly before we get into and before we delve into the Word of God today on the way home from Florida I had the tremendous opportunity of stopping in Burlington Kentucky to spend some time with the group that is doing my higher ground Bible study. There's probably about 150 or so women in this Bible study and the first night I met some of the coordinators and they made an, a scrumptious dinner for us all and it was just so fun. And then the next day I got to meet all the ladies and I had an opportunity to speak to them and share my heart with them. and. And it was just so encouraging hearing what God is doing in their hearts and, and hearing how the Word of God is changing their lives. And, and for most of you, you probably haven't done the Higher Ground Bible study because this is, might be your first one or I haven't taught it for a while. So just so that you know, um, kind of my schedule for the, you know, over this next year is in the springtime, I, I want to do the Bride of Christ because I so want you to experience that Bible study that is unlike any other Bible study that I've ever written and it's so relevant for today for for 21st century believers absolutely and but then I'm gonna take the summer off and I'm gonna write I'm gonna take the summer off from teaching but um, I'm gonna be writing and I'm gonna be writing my new study and I will let you know via email what that uh, topic is, and I'm really excited about that one. But I'm believing that God uh, might be leading us to uh, teach and to go through the Higher Ground Bible study in the fall. So hang in there with me. God has much more, and I know that He's moving in your hearts as He's moving in my heart. And, um, you know, there's nothing like the Word of God that is, there's nothing that can change our lives like the Word of God. That's what I shared with those women in Burlington. And um, like we talked about last week, you know, but it's important that we drink it. If we don't drink it, it's not going to benefit us. And you're in the right place. You are drinking the Word of God. So today we, uh, we embark upon week five. And if you haven't studied it or if you're, a, in your, you're in the process of going through week five, it's called the waiting room. And I think that it's such an important topic because so many times we find ourselves in the waiting room. And as you know, this week you're going to be talking about how the waiting room is really good for us because it can be a time when, when we are going to find contentment where we're going to find contentment. Um, it's a time when, when we can so rest in our Savior because, you know, life, as you know, can get really, really busy and, and just it can be overwhelming at times. And, and, and when, when we are in that time of waiting or that time of like kind of like waiting for God to move us into the next place, that's a great time to find rest in your Savior and just sit at the throne of God, sit at his feet and just take it all in. It's also a time when God can mold us and make us into his image and can, you know, and, and all of that. And it's a time to prepare us for what's next. And it's also a time for us to renew our vision. So those are the things that you're going to learn about this week. But as I was thinking about contentment, or as I was thinking about the waiting room, I was thinking about how um, it really is a good time for us. And, you know, the waiting room can be any time. It can be a difficulty or the desert, as we've been talking about. That is certainly a time of waiting. It can be a lot, it can be a time when um, all of a sudden your life is interrupted and something happens and, and you're, you're, you're thrown into this new um, experience or something that you never experienced and you know like in the Bible uh, there's two in particular that I'm thinking of when their life was interrupted and that was the uh, the Apostle John 
at the very end of his life, you know, when he was planning on retirement and he was thinking about going to heaven because all of his friends and colleagues had already been in heaven and he was the last one that was still on this earth and all of a sudden his life was interrupted when he was taken to the island of Patmos and that's where he received the vision. Um, and the, the book of Revelation was, was written from that experience. And another person that I'm thinking of that all of a sudden her life was completely interrupted and that was Mary. I mean, think about her. She was, she was engaged to be married to the love of her life, the, the man that she would spend the rest of her life with and she was going to do it the exact way that it had always been done, the way that God had intended for it to be done in the Jewish customs. And then all of a sudden her life was interrupted when she, when an angel appeared to her and told her that she was with child. And so all of a sudden things were different for her. So yeah, you and I, we can be interrupted sometimes and sometimes those interruptions are good and sometimes they're, they're, they might not be so welcomed in our lives. Or it could be just an unexpected thing um, that, that really is, is calling our attention or something. And Or it, the time of waiting could be when when God takes you out of one ministry position, but he, had, he hasn't revealed to you what is next. And so you're kind of in that, that waiting period, like, Lord, what is next? What do you want me to do? I've, I've, you know, because maybe you were defined by this, by this um, other ministry position, and so you're just kind of waiting for that time. Or it could be a time when, when, you're, uh, when you're moving along really, really well towards a vision, towards um, a goal in your life, and then all of a sudden everything comes to a screeching halt. And, 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 you sit, and you have to sit back and you have to wait. You have to wait. Or maybe, maybe you have just finished one chapter in your life and, and you know, you're, you're ready for the next chapter of your life. You know, you consider this all, the, all these years, these past years and stuff, one whole chapter and now you've finished that chapter. Maybe a child has gone off to college or, you know, you, or your last one has, has left the, the nest or whatever and, and now you're, you're on to your next chapter but right now you don't know what is next and so you're kind of in that waiting period. So, you know, the waiting period um, is, is, is very um, important and it's also something that we go through a lot, something that happens to us. But there's a lot of verses on waiting and why it's good for us. And the first one that, I, that I'm reading right now is one of my favorite and it probably is one of yours too. And it comes from Isaiah chapter 40 uh, verses 29 to 31. And this is what it says. Now listen carefully. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Can't you relate with that? Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, now that word hope in other translations is translated um, by the word wait. So those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Oh my goodness. Have you ever pictured yourself soaring like an eagle in the sky? I mean, isn't that what they do? They just kind of own the sky as you watch them in flight. And so, you know, that is so important that that's what the waiting room is good for us. But listen to a couple other verses on waiting. Listen to a couple other verses. This verse says in Psalm 27, 14, it says, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. That is so important. Isaiah 30, 18 says, blessed are all who wait for him. Blessed are all who wait for him. Psalm 130 verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits and in his word, I put my hope. So yeah, the Bible tells us that we are to wait on God. So if you're in that waiting room, take time to wait on God. And I have to tell you that the, the, the day in which we live, it's what we might call the microwave era. We don't have to wait for much in this 21st century. Everything is given to us fairly quickly. And, and, and you know, we, we really don't have to wait. And that's why I think sometimes the waiting room can be a really difficult place. 
but but I just want to encourage you. And so today, I want to talk to you about. I want to give you three ways that you can utilize this waiting time or this this period that you're finding yourself in, whether it be the desert or whatever it is. I just want to give you three things that are really really important, and um, and these these are so vital that we embrace these things during this time so the first one is this and listen carefully to this and write it down that you and i when we're in this place it is so absolutely vital and important that we seek god through prayer and his word we seek god through prayer and his word in fact this story is played out beautifully in a chapter in the new testament and that is acts chapter one if you remember jesus had just been on the mountain saying goodbye to all of his all of his faithful followers and they were on the mountain and he was about ready to get lifted up into their sight or lifted from their sight but just prior to that jesus had given them this instruction it says this in um in verse six um verse in verse six of acts chapter one it says so when they met together they asked him lord i'm sorry i meant i meant to go a little bit further up um, on verse four, verse or in verse four, on it says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command: "Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. When you heard me speak about what you heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit." So what is Jesus saying to them? He's saying, "Listen." I am not going to be here any longer. And so after you see me leave, after that moment that you see me leave this earth, I want you to go back into the town and I want you to wait. I want you to go back into Jerusalem and I want you to wait. And for us, um, as we know, that was about 10 days and obviously they didn't know how long that would be. But then listen to what it says. It says in verse 12, it says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk. I walked down that, that pathway that, that was from the Mount of Olives down into Jerusalem, and it was a long, steep hill. It said that they, the, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. And then it has a whole list of people that were in that room. And eventually there was 120 people in that room. But listen to what it says in verse 14. It says, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with the brothers. So what did they do during that time of waiting? As they were waiting, like Jesus told them, they spent time in prayer. And if you remember that day um, that we find in Acts chapter 2, 10 days later, the, the gift was given to them, and that was the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he came in with, with um, pomp and glory and, and power, and he, em, it, he embraced all of them, and he came to indwell every single person in that room. And if you know, they all began to speak in tongues, and, and uh, at that time, Jerusalem was filled with all kinds of people that, that you know spoke all different uh, dialects and languages and everything because they had all come congregated into Jerusalem for the feast. And so Jerusalem was filled with people. But what was happening in this upper room was so amazing, was so amazing that people came, people were wondering what was going on. And if you remember, they were hearing the they were hearing their own language spoken by these people that were just filled up with the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness. And so what does it say? It says that that some of them were, they were all amazed, but some of them were questioning and saying, oh, these people are just drunk. They've had too much to drink. And what does it say Peter did at that moment? It says that Peter stood up in the midst of them and he said, listen, men of Galilee or men of, men of Judea. He said, listen, um, these people aren't drunk as you think they are. It's only nine in the morning. They're not drunk. You know, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And the Holy Spirit is what reminded Peter of the passage in Joel. And how all of a sudden what Joel said is now coming to be. Oh my goodness. But I want to tell you, I want to go back to what they were doing during that waiting period. They were in prayer. And when we spend time in prayer and looking at his word, that opens our ears up. 
that opens our ears up so we can understand what God is telling us. We can hear his voice. I think about the story of, of the shepherd and the sheep, which is just so, such a beautiful, beautiful allegory that Jesus gave in John chapter 10. And if you remember, um, you know, John, Jesus, you know, often would give things that the people could relate to. And this one they could so relate to because they understood what a shepherd was in relation to the sheep and, and the sheep in relation to the shepherd. And if you know, sheep cannot make it without their shepherd. And so the shepherd was always close by. He was always whispering things to them and, and, and reassuring them and giving them promises and telling them things that they needed. And the sheep's ears were always open. He was always listening for that shepherd's voice, for that shepherd's voice. And you and I are sheep and we have a shepherd. And listen to what Jesus says about the shepherd and the sheep. In verse 27 of John chapter 10, he says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So are you listening? Are you listening? Do you have your ears tuned in? The, the best way for us to tune our ears in and for us to listen is to spend time in prayer. Spend time at the, in the word of God. I just received an email not too long ago from a, a friend of mine, and she's had a lot of incredible things happen this year. I mean, a lot of life changes in one year. And she said that when she was doing the Bible study, the, the, the wilderness wandering study, she said um, all of a sudden, you know, she was kind of doing it because she felt like she had to do it for a while. Don't we all find ourselves in that position sometimes? And then all of a sudden, one day she was just doing it, and it was just like, God, God was just like the words of his of his of the word of God were just coming off the pages into her heart and and God was so speaking to her and all of a sudden she she had her vision renewed and and she knew what she was to do and she knew what God was telling her to do and that's why it's so important for us to stay in the word of God and I was just thinking about one story that you're probably familiar with and we're all kind of familiar with it it's a story found in Luke chapter 10 and it's a story about Mary and Martha. When Jesus had come to their home, they had a brother by the name of Lazarus. And this is before Lazarus had died. But Jesus would often come through and stay at their home when he would, uh, when he would be passing through town. And he would have some of his meetings there. Well, on this particular day, you know, Jesus was there in the home. And, um, and, and Martha was, was busy and distracted with all the things that were going on in her life and the meal preparations and all of that. But Mary found herself totally removed from all the distractions, just sitting at Jesus' feet, just listening to him, taking it all in. And what did Jesus say? Jesus praised her for that. And so, you know what? You and I live in a time when we have distractions in our life, you know, so many things are going on every single day. Every single day we have distractions in our life. And so I just want to encourage you. It's so important. It's so important for you to take time away from your busyness, from, from all the distractions and go away with God. Francis Roberts has a book out that's called Come Away, My Beloved. Come Away, My Beloved. So I want to encourage you, um, as you know, uh, when I came home after being gone for a month, uh, I came home to a great surprise. And the surprise was is that my husband had taken one of the bedrooms in our upstairs and converted it into a prayer room for me. I have to tell you that I've been in that room like almost nonstop because as you know, that is so where my heart is at. And, and I try and make it a point every day to just remove the, the distractions. My husband said to me, well, Cheryl, you know, you can put your, um, you can put your, your computer up there and everything. And I'm like, no, nope, no, nope, I'm not even going to take my phone up there. This is my place alone with God. So I can hear him speaking to me. He even built a cross with the crown of thorns on it and a purple sash. I mean, it's just amazing. And you may have seen pictures on Facebook if you're uh, friends with me on Facebook. But anyway, so, so that's so important. I have a friend, and her name is Connie, and when I, uh, went, when I went to Florida, I stopped and, and met her. She's been doing the online studies, and, um, 
And what a, what a blessing because she gave me an incredible gift. And she started this prayer book. And I just wanted to share this with you because there's a, several different things that she does in this prayer book that I thought might be helpful for you and I as we take that time away to be with God, as we remove all those distractions. So, so sometimes what she'll do is she'll take a verse and um, then she'll, based on that verse, she'll write a prayer out to the Lord based on what she just read. Or she'll sit back and she'll listen to him speaking to her. And so obviously she wrote this for me, but this is something that I've practiced for many, many years. And so I just wanted to, to, to show you how you can make that time so special. So I always say that prayer and the word of God go hand in hand. So when I'm in prayer, I usually have my Bible right in front of me because that's God's word and that's how he speaks to us. But this is what Connie says. She takes the verse in Psalm 63, 1 through 6, and she writes out the verse. And she says this, Oh God, you are my God. Er Early will I seek you. My flesh longs for you in a day and in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Your constant love is better than life itself. And she goes on. I'm not going to read you the whole passage, but that's one of my favorite passages. And it was a passage that, that I loved when I was in the desert, when I was really struggling in my life. After she read that verse, then she went and she said, Lord, I'm listening. Please speak to me based on your word. And this is what he said. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This was, um, she wrote a prayer to him based on that verse. So this is what she said. Each day I wake longing for you. My soul emerges from sleep, hungry for your touch, your voice, your face. Oh, Abba, how does one face one day without you? The hunger I feel excites me, for I know you will fill me full. Your presence is sweet, and I am satisfied in Jesus' name. And then, and then a little bit longer or further on in the, in the book, she wrote out Colossians 1.13, which says, I have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's own son. And then on the next page, she sat and she listened for him to speak to her. And this is what he said to her based on this verse. Beloved one. When you believed, I drew you out of the enemy, uh, out of the enemy's camp and set you firmly in my family. I gave you my son's name, his heritage, his authority, and his power. You now live above all principalities because you live in him. Darkness is now light. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you and I... You know what? God's, God wants to speak to each one of us. He wants to show us. He wants us to open our ears up so he can speak to you and to me. His voice is not reserved just for the pastors of your church and just for the, your Bible study teacher or just for your leaders or, or whatever. No, his voice is reserved for you and for me. And you and I can hear his voice. So I want to encourage you, get a prayer book like this and do exactly what I'm showing you, what Connie has had did for me or had has done for me and what, um, what I've done in the past as well. One last, one last entry here. James 5.16, she writes out this verse and it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous one avails much. It says, okay, so it talks about prayer. It says, listen, if you pray, it, it will avail much. And so what she did on the next page is she wrote prayer list and then she left it blank. And so in other words, if, if, because we learn about what prayer says, it's really important to just write out your prayer list. So I wanted to share with you that because this is one awesome way, awesome way to use that time of, of that wilderness or that, uh, that waiting time to seek God through prayer and his word. So my friends, let's seek God through prayer and his word during this time when when we don't know what's next but it's so important for us to hear God's voice the second thing on how we can utilize the waiting room is that we should seek to bring glory to God in everything everything that we do of course Paul was the perfect example and we learned it as we studied um, the as we studied Acts chapter 16 this week and 
We looked at what happened to him. I mean, think about think about what he did. I mean, my goodness, you know, he was one of the, God's greatest ambassadors. He was the the greatest evangelist of the first century. He was bringing countless thousands to Christ. So he comes into the city and he's arrested and he's and he's uh, tried and and he's beaten unmercifully and you know horribly beaten, thrown into prison, shackled by the ankles. I mean. He could have had a pity party, could he not have? I mean, he was he was shackled and and in in excruciating pain. He could have been pounding his fists on the wall and on the on the floor and saying, "God, why? Why did you allow this to happen?" But he didn't do that. Instead, he praised God and he sang hymns. Him and Silas were just singing through the night and and it, and that and later on, of course, God did a miracle as well by opening up the prison doors. But later that night, the jailer and his family were baptized, and I'm imagining that many of the inmates heard Jesus Christ that night, and, and they fell on their knees before him and gave their hearts over to him as well. Paul was a perfect example of how you and I can bring glory to God no matter what is going on. When I think about bringing glory to God, this is what the vision I got. Is that when we bring when we bring glory to God in our circumstances, especially in those difficult times, you know what we do? We magnify Jesus. We magnify him. That's what Paul did in Philippi. So how can you and I bring glory to God in everything that we do? Well, let's take a look at some scriptures here. Let's just take a look at, at, at what um what we learn in scripture. In 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 8, this is what it says. Now listen carefully. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate. So in other words, get along with people. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil for evil or insult with insult, but with blessing because of because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing for whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So that is a great passage for us to try and live out every day. If you go on a little bit further in Peter, it says in, in chapter 5, beginning with verse 8, it says this, be self-controlled and alert. Be self-controlled. Are you being self-controlled? Are you controlling your desires, your, your evil desires that Satan might be putting in your heart or putting in your mind, I should say? Are you controlling yourself? Are you alert? And then another passage in James chapter 4 uh, chapter 4, verse 7, it says this, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. So are you submitting yourself to God? Are you submitting yourself to God? Are you resisting the devil at all opportunities? When you know that he has, has put a, a temptation in your mind, or he's dangling something before your eyes, are you resisting him? Or, and are you submitting yourself to God? And are you drawing near to God? In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know these verses. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will, and he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord. So yeah, we might not know what's down the road and we don't know what, you know where God is going to lead us. And we're in this, in this dry period of time but are you trusting god that he has a plan are you trusting him to fulfill it even if you have to go around every day and recite that verse lord i'm trusting you lord i'm trusting you at every moment of every day i've had to do that many times because the more you say it the more you say his word the more it will become a reality in your life and you'll and you'll be speaking it a lot more and it will be and you'll be believing it so trust in the Lord, trust him with your life, trust him with your circumstances, know that he has a plan and a purpose. 
And then it also says in Deuteronomy 6, um, 5, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So are you loving God? Are you loving Him with everything that you have, everything that's inside of you? Are you loving God? So basically, if we could just sum up some of these verses that we just looked at and we just read in Scripture, I believe that the way to glorify God is what it says in James 1.22. It says that we should not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So in other words, that's why it's so important for us to be in prayer and in the study of his word and reading his word and pondering it and meditating it on it because we can't live it out and do it if we don't, if we're not, if we're not reading it, if we're not reading it, if we're not studying it. So it is really, really important for us to bring glory to God in everything. As I was thinking about this whole concept, I was remembering the song that Stephen Curtis sings so beautifully called Do Everything. Listen to these lyrics. It says, you're picking up toys on the living room floor the, for the 15th time today, matching up socks and sweeping up lost Cheerios that got away. You put a baby on your hip and color on your lips and head out the door. And while I may not know you, I bet I know you wonder sometimes, does it matter at all? Well, let me remind you that it matters just as long as you do everything you do to the glory of the one who made you. Because he made you to do every little thing that you do to bring a smile to his face and tell the story of grace. And that's what you're doing by bringing glory to him. You are bringing a smile to his face as you tell the story of grace. I told my husband that when he built me that prayer room, imagine the smile on Jesus' face for what he was doing when he was planning and preparing all this without my knowing it. Imagine the smile on Jesus' face knowing that that would be my own sanctuary in my house. And then it says this, maybe you're the, that guy with the suit and tie. Maybe your shirt says your name. You may be hooking up mergers, cooking up burgers, but at the end of the day, little stuff, big stuff, in between stuff, God sees it all the same. Well, maybe you're sitting in math class, maybe on a mission in the Congo, maybe you're working at the office singing along with the radio, maybe you're dining at a five-star or feeding orphans in the Myanmar, anywhere and everywhere you are, whatever you do, it all matters. So do whatever you do and don't ever forget to do everything you do to the glory of the one who made you because he made you to do every little thing that you do to bring a smile to his face. A smile to his face so that you can tell the story of grace so that you can tell the story of grace so my friends let's make sure that we try and bring glory to God in everything let Paul be your example and just live out his word no matter what is going on in your life no matter what is going on in your life so the first thing is that we need to seek God through prayer and his word. The second thing is that we need to seek to bring glory to God in everything. And the third thing is this, is that you use this time, use this time to ask God what his purpose is and his plan is for your life. It's okay to ask. In fact, I want to tell you that God doesn't just have a plan and a purpose for the entire world and for the church and, and for the leaders of the church. No, he's got a plan for your life and for my life. He has it, but we don't know what that is if we don't ask him, if we don't ask him. So he, he really does have a plan. Um, listen to these verses that I, that I ran across um, just the other day, and they spoke to me so mightily, so mightily. So listen to these words. In Psalm 33, beginning with verse 11, it says, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. Did you hear that last part? He looks down from on heaven and he forms the hearts of all. He forms your heart and he considers everything that you do. 
every little thing that you do. The God of the universe cares about you and cares about me. And he has a plan for our lives. You know the passage that many of you probably have labeled it your your life verse or your life passage, but it says this in Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plan to give you a, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. You know what? God is, or Jer Jeremiah is writing and speaking to the nation of Israel, but the nation of Israel was comprised of individual people. And he says, listen, you know, listen, if you seek me, you will find me. If you ask me, if you just ask me, I will tell you what my plan is, what my purpose is for your life. Just ask me. Just ask me. And I want to remind you that while this was written back in the Old Testament, and, you know, for the nation of Israel, you and I are still God's chosen people. We've been grafted in to the family tree. We've been grafted in the moment that we came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. That when the Holy Spirit came in as our deposit, we've been grafted in. So these passages are vital and important, and we can take them as our own. So just remember that. Remember that all we have to do is ask him. Paul tells us what his mission is, what, what, his, what his purpose is, what God's plan is for him. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, it says, We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we might present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Paul knew the mission that he was called to. He was called to bring believers into the faith, belie believers into the, into the family of God. But then he was also called to train and equip them to maturity in Christ. To maturity in Christ. And, and it tells us in Philippians 2.25 that Epaphroditus was called to be Paul's messengers. He was called to come alongside Paul and take messages when Paul was in prison to the churches and to the, to the places where he was writing to the in, individual people as well. So, so yes, God does have a plan, not just for Paul, not just for Epaphroditus, but for you and for me as well. So what is your passion? You know, what is your passion? I, I have to say that, you know, God has told me what my, what my purpose and my passion, or what my purpose and my plan is, or his plan is, his purpose and his plan for my life. And that is to, there's, there, it really kind of compiles three things. First of all, to train his people in the word of God, to train his people in the word of God. And I so hope that I'm, I'm doing it. And, and, you know, this is a passion of mine. This is a passion of mine. I hope that my passion comes out. In fact, when I was speaking to that group in Kentucky, one gal approached me later and she said, Cheryl, you know what I loved about listening to you talk she said, I love the fact that when you read God's word, you read it with passion, you read it with authority, and, and you, you can just tell how much you love it. Oh my goodness, is there any other way to read the word of God? Is there any other way to get into the word of God but through passion? Well, this is my passion. God's put it on my heart, and I hope to, to, that I'm doing it to the best of my ability, to the way that God would have me do it. I hope so, and I, I, you know, it's not just doing these tapes. And, and doing the Bible studies and writing the Bible studies. I try and do it with every venue, whether it be posting on Facebook or whether it be sending an email to somebody that God's put on my heart or whether it be to call somebody or, you know, or, or text somebody, just an encouraging word. Or, and a lot of times and most of the time, I usually try to incorporate scripture in there, something for them to think about, you know, so, a, a, a word that God's given to me for them. So I try to do it in with every, whatever venue is before me on that day or at that moment. And so, you know, my, my call or um, the call on my life from God and the purpose of my life and the passion of my life is to train his people in the word of God to prepare his people for eternity. Prepare his people for eternity. Oh my goodness. And then to bring hope to a world filled with chaos. To bring hope to a world filled with chaos. And I do that through the word of God because there's nothing that gives 
people hope more than the Word of God. The Word of God is the only thing that can give you and I complete hope. Complete hope. So that's my that's God's call in my life, and I don't know what it is for you. So I would ask I would ask you first of all to really evaluate what your passion is. What are you passionate about? You know, maybe maybe you just have this real passion to get involved with political issues. Oh my goodness, is that ever needed? And you can use that as a ministry to to, to share Christ, to magnify Jesus Christ in whatever you're doing. Or maybe it's to work with young people. I had this one gal approach me in Kentucky um, during our lunch after I spoke. And she said to me that um, she's been taking the portions of the Higher Ground Bible Study and writing other portions to go along with it to make it for young people, for her kids and for kids in her youth group that she's involved in. And I was so moved by that. And I said to her, listen, I would pray about, about really making it the best that you can make it and try and getting it published because there's such a need. She sees a need for God, for, for all of these people to come alongside um, or, or come the word of God to come alongside these young people and to train them up. It might be maybe God's leading you to teach or, or maybe he's, uh, he's calling you to come alongside somebody in whatever capacity that is and however he wants to use you. Come alongside somebody that's made a difference in your life, someone that, that you so admire and respect and you say, oh, you know what, they have a great ministry. I want to help them in whatever way that I can. Or maybe he's asking you to lead or to speak or whatever, but, but find out what your passion is. What are you most passionate about and ask him how he might use that for his glory and his honor so so we you and I can use this time of waiting to find out what that passion passion is or to find out what that purpose is for our lives so my friends the waiting room is a good time for us it is a good time for us make sure that you seek God through prayer and his word make sure that you seek to glorify God in everything you do because then Jesus Christ is magnified and make sure that you find out what God's purpose and plan is for your life so until next time my friends have a wonderful and blessed week